Dane, what's good? Not much. How you doing? Everything good, man. Thank you for coming in. Uh, my pleasure. So, uh, for those who don't know, you are the co-founder of Funk Volume Records. Yes. Okay, so talk about how initially this whole situation came together. So, Funk Volume, in, in 2008, so I was working as a, as a management consultant at Deloitte Consulting in Chicago. Um, got laid off, and then shortly after got a phone call from my brother, who's Swizz, who was on the label. Um, he was going to UC Irvine at the time, and he was like, damn, I'm frustrated at school. I really think I want to take this, this, this music thing full time and take a crack at it. Um, I also got a friend, him and Hobson went to high school together. So he was like, I also have a friend, slightly different situation because he was signed to Ruthless at the time. But, um, you know, he wasn't happy with that situation and he wanted to do his own thing. So the three of us, you know, got together, we talked about it and decided we were going to start Funk Volume. How did he get out of Ruthless Records? Um, eventually a, a lawyer that we knew, because um, they just had an option to pick up, you know, the next, his next album and it expired. So we just sent the letter, sent it, said him we wanted it for him to get released, and they never responded, and he, he just got released. Okay. So. so you guys formed Funk Volume. Right. You, Hobson, and your brother Swiss. Yeah. So Hobson and I are 50-50 owners, and my brother was he, my brother was there from the beginning, but he wasn't an owner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the interview that we did with Hobson, he had mentioned that originally he didn't want to do 50-50. He wanted to do like 80-20. Yeah, we were equal partners. So I, re I remember the first the first meeting that we had, um, and this was like 2008 ish. We because um, he said he wanted to help out. So me, him, and Swizz, we met at at Swizz's house at at the kitchen table, and we were talking about like the the splits and how we're gonna do everything. And Dame had asked me what he was like. So what what do I envision? Like how do I see the percentage thing going? And I told him more like you know in an 80-20 split with, you know, as far as ownership goes. And he said if it was going to be that, then it, it's not going to be worth his time and he's not going to be able to invest all of his time into it and he's going to have to do other things. And he wanted more, he wanted 50-50. And so, you know, me being kind of a, I guess you'd say an ignorant, stupid artist at the time where all I just was focusing on is rap and not the business side, I agreed. And we, you know, so then from there, from there on out, we started putting out music and, you know, we were splitting everything in half. So he did push back in the beginning, but, but for me, you know, if, if I'm, because for me, what I'm bringing to the table is business acumen and money. You know, I helped pretty much fund everything that we did in the beginning. Okay. Um, so it was like, I'll take responsibility for the business and, and what he was supposed to be was kind of like, if there is such thing as like a chief creative officer, like that's what he would have been, like not only for himself, but for other artists as, as we grew and, and brought on artists, the idea was for him to help with their production, with their videos and stuff like that. And I would take care of everything on the business end so they can focus on the music. So you guys are 50-50 partners. Right. And you just said that you put some money into the company to kind of get things going. Do you remember about how much you invested initially? No, I mean, I probably, you know, I was never, I probably put in at least 50. Um, over the course of, because for two or three years, I mean, we weren't making any money. This okay. wasn't, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily my job until, you know, we were able to, to make it my job and I was actually receiving income. But, you know, for three years, I was doing stuff on the side to pay my own bills. And, you know, I even paid hops rent a few times, um, you know, so there wasn't any money coming in. Yeah. But I, you know, I put up the website, helped us travel, buy the merchandise, um, all the legal expenses and stuff like that. So that was all me in the beginning. Okay. So after about two or three years, what started to happen with the company? Um, so we got Hop out of his deal. We released Raw. Well, before that, we released Haywire just for free, just to kind of build up, build the fan base and build the presence that was a, a collaboration project that him and my brother did together. Um, you know, that was cool. Got some additional exposure from that. Just kind of continue to build the momentum. Um, and then we dropped Raw, his first album, on, like on funk volume after we got him out of the Ruthless situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, did okay. And, and again, it's kind of just a process of continually building on small wins. 
Um, so that's how we, we just built momentum like that, like really aggressively, you know, taking the social media, interacting with fans, um, putting out music, putting out videos, you know, eventually really just building our fan base until we got enough demand to do a tour. Okay. Um, and my, we put together the raw tour all by ourselves. You guys do the tour, mm -hmm. then what happens next? Um, so we do the tour and then it's just back to, to putting out content. You know, Hobson dropped, uh, I think, Ill Mind 4 after that. They got a lot of response. Um, you know, he, he takes a shot at, at Tyler, the creator, and thinking that that's what really kind of sparks the views on that video. Um, it, I think that's when also he, he did a collaboration with Tech 9 and B.O.B. Um, uh, and then eventually the Double XL freshman cover. So again, man, it's just a process of continually building on those small wins and, and not resting on them, but figuring out, you know, what can we do next? Um, and then we signed Dizzy, and we got to a point where we signed Dizzy, I think in 2012. Um, I, saw, I saw him online, I found him online, and it just so happened that he was at a local competition in Burbank that he won, and then I got to meet him in person and just develop that relationship. Uh, and he saw what we had going on. We brought him out to Denver because we were doing a show in Denver and he was in, impressed with what we had going on. So he, he joined in 2012. And then shortly after that, we, we picked up Jaron as well. Jaron Benton? Yep. Okay. At what point did the, the Warner Brothers deal come together? The Warner Brothers deal happened, um, I think at the end of 2014. Okay, so that came later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So everything was was super independent, um, and I would I would still consider us being independent even with that Warner deal. It was just a distribution deal uh, for the most part, but um, that deal didn't come into play until I think like the, yeah the end of 2014 because all the projects released last year, um, Jaren Slow Motion, uh, Dizzy's The Growing Process, and then Hop's album were were released uh, distributed by Warner. After the Warner Brothers deal, did things start to change in terms of the company, the effect of the music, et cetera, et cetera? No, I, uh, no, I mean, I think last year it was, you know, it was a disappointing year for us internally because I, we didn't reach our expectations. Um, and, and you can probably point the finger in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, the guys were definitely unhappy um, with the Warner deal. I felt it was a lot of it is because they didn't really understand it. Um, but I also could have expected more from Warner as well. So I was talking to him. I wasn't exactly happy with it either, but I was trying to fix it and I was acknowledging the things that they were doing. Um, I think one of the disconnects is, you know, in the social media age, everything happens so fast, very instant gratification, you know, so from Hop's perspective, since that's the, the world that he lives in, you know, he sees the reactions right away. So if he posts something, he sees the likes, he sees everything happen so fast. You know, the things that Warner was bringing to the table, it was more like planting seeds in, in relationship building. And I was trying to get them to understand that. It was like, things aren't just gonna, you know, happen right away. And again, it was just a distribution deal. It wasn't like we signed a Warner. They didn't have an incentive to like grow everything for us. Yeah. You know, it was a, per a small percentage of sales deal because um, we still wanted to act and move how we wanted to move like independently. So, you know, I think there was just a lack of understanding of what the deal was and not really acknowledging what they were doing because they couldn't see it right away. Did Warner Brothers help on the radio side at all or not really? Well, I can't really say we made radio music. Um, you know, we, like when Dizzy's project dropped, he had some songs that, the, and they would kind of send them to radio to get their, to get their reaction to them. Um, Cause I wasn't gonna, you know, put more money into radio if the reaction wasn't genuine and we didn't have a song that, that would resonate. You can waste a lot of money at radio. Right. Um, so, but they did um, put together tours for Dizzy to go meet people at radio again planting those seeds yeah um, so that he knows them and it's not and when, when he does have that record it's not just a record that gets sent it's like oh this kid this is the kid that came in you know with Warner that one time very impressive kid and 
that's the kind of things that I think Warner was, it was planting those seeds for that when we do have a record, because it wasn't about, we, it, Funk Volume was never really about like making music for anybody else, but for what the artist wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if and when those records came around, we were playing those seeds and building those relationships so that it, we could go. At what point did you and Hobson start having some issues? Um, we never really had, like, we, and because cause Hop's not the type of person that will talk to you if he has an issue. Okay. Um, you know, so I felt a little tension during the tour um, that they did last year because I didn't go on the whole tour. Um, and I guess that's part of the problem, too, because, you know, from their, from, at least from his perspective, like if you're not on the tour, you're not doing anything for the tour. Um, not understanding that these tours start six, seven months out in terms of the planning. Um, so I noticed that there was some tension on, there were some things that happened on the tour. Um, so I definitely noticed some tension there. And then after the tour, a little bit of tension, um, but it wasn't anything that was, it wasn't anything that was discussed. Um, until I asked him, I think our last show on the tour was, was in Vegas. There was a, like the tour ended, there was a little bit of time and then there was a Vegas show. I was like, hop, what's up, man? We good? Like, are we good? He was like, like yeah. And then, um, you know, I asked him again and then he said that, you know, he thinks he just needs a, a, a new team, another manager. Not a whole new label, but just an, another manager. One of the things that he mentioned that was that you were the label co-owner the manager, and I guess the accountant? I'm definitely not the art accountant. <laughs> Did that's, I get that that's, wrong? That, that's one of, he says that and even says that in the song, but I'm not an accountant. Um, we've had a business manager for the past five years, and actually the business manager that he still has is the business manager that we had for six years. So okay. that was either him not understanding or him kind of in, embellishing what was going on. But okay. manager and label owner, yes. Okay. Accountant, no. No. I didn't even, I've never even withdrawn anything from the Funk Volume account myself um, ever since we've had a business manager. It's all gone through the business manager 99% of the time with Hobson copied on all those emails because he's a co owner. Okay. So I guess at one point, Hobson sent you a list of demands. Yeah, he did. <laughs> okay. Uh, he wanted to get rid of Funk Volume Fitness. Yes. What is Funk Volume Fitness? So Funk Volume Fitness was a, an initiative that I started. It's kind of a passion project of mine just to try to use the influence that we have to kind of get people to live a healthier lifestyle, um, both from a fitness standpoint, nutrition, and mind. Uh, so it's something very small, not that many people knew about. Um, I mean, the Funk Volume Fitness page probably had like 10,000 fans versus his page that has, you know, close to 3 million now. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I, to that, I was like, no, because I asked you before I started this initiative if it was cool, and you said, okay, and I just invested my own money into putting up, so I didn't ever use any of his money for this. Like, I invested my own money into a website and to the things that we were doing. We are doing, like, boot camps on a monthly basis, and now all of a sudden you just you know, tell me it's gone? Like, okay. No, if you didn't, if you weren't cool with the idea in the beginning, you should have just been like, Dame, I respect what you're doing, but, but can you use a different name? You want to get rid of the uh, company logo and lose the, the orange color? Yeah, well, the orange color is something that he never really subscribed to anyway, so it wasn't something that we were, I mean, our orange was on our website, um, but it wasn't something that, so that I was fine with. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like, if, as long as everybody on the label is cool with, with, with the new logo, then let's go. Let's rock with it. I'm okay. not going to push back with that at all. Uh, he wanted to bring in A&R and a stylist? Yeah, so the, I was cool with that too. But it, it, it threw me because it's like we always prided ourselves on the artists kind of representing who they are and not really needing people from the industry. Um, so when he said that he wanted people from the industry to come in and, and help with what we had going on, I was like, I was a little, that's not how we've been rocking, but that's cool too. Now you were managing not only Hobson, but also, uh, Jared, uh, Jared Benton and, and Dizzy. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, and I guess Hobson had an issue with that? That was one of the, but he didn't. He didn't have an issue until, until that email. That was, yeah. another, that was another one of the demands. Right. He, he, he didn't want you managing the other artists. 
Right. And, and my response to that was, you know, for, for, for you and your situation, you're allowed to say who you want to manage you. But for the other guys, unless they tell me they want a new manager, you know, I'm going to continue managing them and y you shouldn't and can't control that. He had an issue with the percentages of the album proceeds uh, going back to funk volume. Right. So the way, so it's 50-50 so it's label split, but he's also an artist signed to the label, right? So, and, and, and it's tiered the way we do, the way we do our, our album split. So if an album is 60% to the label and 40% to the artist profit, Hobson owns 50% of that 30%. So 40 would go directly to Hobson. Yeah. Right, so for an album, let's just say forty goes directly to Hobson. That sixty percent, because a man, the way we calculate, because I am a label owner and a manager, the way we calculate split the management percentage is we take twenty percent of that forty percent, but we back it out of the sixty. Right, okay. so that's like eight yeah. percent. So Hobson will get forty percent on an album. I will get eight percent, and then that fifty-two that's left is kind of what we still own fifty-fifty. Yeah. So in actuality. You know, Hobson really owns that 40 plus that 26, um, which, which to me is an awesome deal because it's like if you're just an artist with a manager, you're giving the manager 20%. So for that, four, for that additional 14%, Hobson has somebody basically running an entire label for him, making money off other artists. Um, you know, if, if, if you don't think that's fair, I mean, everybody's allowed their own opinion, but I think that's, that's, that's pretty, but that's how, it, that's how it worked. Now, I would think the next logical step is, let's go meet in person and let's have a conversation, because, you know, yes. an email is, you know, not, not a yes. way to end a company. Yes, that would have, and I tried, like I told him, like, look, we got at least get on the phone, like these are email conversations, but at this time he blocked my number. So I couldn't even I couldn't even call him, um, you know. So I was in my mind at that time. I was like, okay, this is getting blown out of proportion. I still don't think we're ending the label. I think you know I think cooler heads will prevail. But I couldn't even I couldn't even talk to him because I I literally sent him an email. I was like, Hop, I I gotta be able to to explain to you why I feel the way I feel, you know, because this all started when I when I suggested that he didn't work that hard. Okay. So you said that. Yeah. And from what I understand, some of the stuff that I read, you weren't referring to his, you know, music creative process. Right. You were referring to the promo that goes after music has been released. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and even beyond that, like, I mean, Hop works tremendously hard at the music. Like, when he's working on a song, like, he'll spend hell hours on one song, you know, and even with his videos. Um, you know, but that's a small, that's a small percentage of what we have to do. I mean, when you're, you know, when it, when it's time to do your album and you're missing flights on purpose to New York, uh, we're missing days of promo, you're not showing up on time, you're not showing up prepared. You know, we had tens of thousands of dollars in videos that never came out because he wouldn't finish them. Um, I mean, there's just so many things that, that happen and it, and when I said that, it wasn't even a conversation about that. It was a conversation about um, the tour and the tour profits. So Hobson goes and does a diss video yeah. about you. <laughs> How did you feel when you first saw it? Um, I mean, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing because, like, I'm not, you know, I come from, I'm older, number one, and, and two, I, you know, I come from a corporate environment. I still have a lot of business school friends and, like other people that are connected with me on Facebook and LinkedIn and when they start seeing this shit trending, it's like, and in a bad light too, you know, it's not, it's not the image that they're accustomed or not, yeah, it's not the image they're accustomed to seeing or the relationship that I have with them. So um, I think it's just embarrassing. It's sad. It's a little sad. It's a lot of mixed emotion. I, of course, angry, um, ridiculous. <laughs> um, you know, because again, a lot of this stuff could have been talked out. And a lot of it's just misunderstanding. Um, you know, it, it could have been communicated. It didn't have to go to that at all. Like, it, it's... Um, 
But sad is probably the biggest, I mean, it's probably the biggest emotion after seeing it. Well, in the video, he compares you to Jerry Heller. <laughs> Hop's comparisons are always hilarious. Um, you know, and I met Jerry Heller like last year. He, re <laughs> he reached out to us. Okay. Um, and after going through this, like I never knew the specifics of, of the NWA situation. You just kind of vaguely know the story and you understand Jerry Heller as a bad guy. And you just, you don't, but you, nobody knows exactly what happened. Hobson said you had a gambling problem? I do spend more money than I should gambling. Okay. And you live in Vegas now. Yeah. yeah which yeah. probably doesn't help. Yeah, it doesn't. But, I, <laughs> but it never, but that, that to me was just like a shot for no reason because it was like, it, it never, I never like took the funk volume funds and went to, you know, the casino. It, like, I'm like, it, that to me was just kind of ridiculous and just kind of a low blow. But, but yeah, I do spend more money than I should gambling. One of the things that Hobson mentioned in our interview was that there would be meet and greets for the funk volume artists and you were getting money for that. And, then, and, and to know that Dame was going to get money from these meet and greets and they weren't. Dame was getting money from the meet and greets? That's what, yes, he was getting money from the meet and greets. So this is, this is one where there's just a misunderstanding, right? And so when I do the budgeting for a tour, right, we have the money that comes in from the shows, mm -hmm. and then we sell meet and greets separately, so that, that money's separate. Um, but like for Jaron, for example, when I decide like what we can afford to pay him per show, I'm not, I didn't look at it as two separate buckets. I looked, I totaled them and decided, okay, we can afford to pay Jaron this amount per show. So, and I'm gonna use fake numbers, but let's just say I said, okay, I'm gonna pay Jaron 500 a show. In my mind, that's 500 for the show, 500, I mean, that's, that includes the show and the meet and greet. Because when I decided what to pay him, I looked at that total number of expected revenue, right? So what I should have done, and this is an error in my way in understanding like communication going forward, is if I'm paying somebody $500, I should just say 400 for the show and 100 for the meet and greet. It's not going to change the amount of money I give you, but yeah. you'll understand that you're getting paid for both. So now Hobson has announced that he's leaving the label, he's splitting up with you, et right. cetera. Now the two artists, you know, uh, Benton and, uh, and Wright, they want to stay with you? So, so me and Dizzy still work together. Okay. So Jaron decided that he wanted to do his own thing. Um, Independently. And, right. So Jaron and I are still, you know, really good friends. Literally just talked to him yesterday. So there's no bad blood whatsoever. Um, but he just decided that his, his exact words to me was like, Dame, I'm getting older. I should know more about this shit. So I'm going to just do my own thing. So Dizzy's staying with you. Right. Now, staying with you, does that mean funk volume or does it mean something else? No, funk, funk volume's over. I mean, when we, when, when Hop left, you know, I, I thought that for a second, I thought that we can kind of continue funk volume, you know, without, of course, we would take our blows from social media and people talking, but I thought we can keep moving. But Jaron and Dizzy didn't want to, because they thought, you know, they always saw it as kind of Hop's thing. Um, you know, and they didn't want to continue holding a flag for, for someone that had left. Um, you know, they just wanted new beginnings. So funk volume is being dissolved. It's okay, no so longer. funk volume yeah. is, is, is gone. Right. Now, Dizzy Wright uh, did an interview where he defended you right. and said that Hobson overlooked uh, a lot that what you did for the label. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, he said it a couple of times, but I... I it was a hip-hop DX interview. I okay. Um, what is, from your point of view, what is Dizzy's take on this whole situation? Um, I mean, I think he's, he's, he's disappointed because um, he, he, he was really waving the funk volume flag for the past two years, something that he really believed in. You know, he's got it tatted on his leg. Um, I don't think he thought it would come to this. Um, I mean, he tried to get us to talk. He was he was kind of like the mediator in the situation, but but um, you know, Hop didn't want to talk to me. So you know, I, I think ultimately he's just really disappointed 
and probably feels a little bit betrayed because he subscribed to it wholeheartedly. At one point, Bow Wow and Jermaine Dupri had massive amounts of success together. Bow Wow wanted to leave. You see that his level of success is not the same. They ultimately managed to reunite and create another great project together. They ended up selling, you know, back to the original levels and so forth. Mm -hmm. These types of things happen. People get right. emotional. People make diss videos. People right. get on social media right. and so forth. You guys made an impact. You guys built up a fan base. You guys signed artists. You guys went on tours. Mm -hmm. All of this without a major company behind you. Right. When you, when you just, when, you know, when you take a step back and look at this, this isn't salvageable? Maybe not at this very moment, but sometime in the future? Um, a conversation, I mean, at this point, because I, I feel like this was just ridiculous. Like, it was just so ridiculous. And I, I you know, I don't think, I'm always willing to have a conversation. And, and anybody that's ever, you know, done me wrong, I'm willing to hear them out and, and accept apologies and things like that. But Hop, Hop won't, I mean, he didn't want to talk then. I'm sure he doesn't want to talk now. Um, I think it's a shame. I think we were so close too. I mean, we what we built w was special, but we weren't even, you know, we were probably twenty percent to where I I knew we could get. Hobson was on the Double XL freshman issue along with Future, right. Iggy Azalea, Macklemore, French Montana, right. Kid Ink. Uh, Machine Gun Kelly and Danny Brown. Do you feel that that Hobson could have achieved the levels of the other people on that on that freshman cover? For sure, for sure. Um, you know, Hop likes to work a certain way, and I kind of let him let him do that. Um, you know, but I felt like he didn't reach his pot potential as an individual artist yet, and I don't. And, and we definitely didn't reach the potential as a collective because cats didn't even work together. Um, you know, I think they, you know, and Dizzy says this in a recent interview, like they were in the interview, they were in the studio together twice in four years. You saw the Hobson interview on Vlad TV? Yes. Well, what did you uh, feel about it? I mean, I thought it was interesting because it, like, <laughs> because on, on one, in, in, in the first, I think it was the first part of the interview, you talk about how somebody takes your money and then like back to back you do an interview about how you're a millionaire. Like, it was, it was just weird to me um, because the, the picture that was, was painted of myself is just, it is not what, it is not what happened. It, it, it's, it's the furthest thing that happened. Um, you know, and, and I'm and I'm not doing this interview to kind of point the finger at Hop, but it's, it was sad. Like, it was, it was sad um, to hear him say some of the things because if he really didn't understand certain things, we could have just talked about it. Now that Funk Volume is a wrap, mm -hmm. what are you working on next? I'm still working with Dizzy, and Dizzy announced it and too soon, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to start another label. Okay. Still moving. Um, oh, that's the name of the label. Yeah, 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 still moving. Yeah, I see it on your hat right there. So this was like still moving. That was something that was a message while we ran because this still has the Funk Volume logo on it. So this was still a Funk Volume hat. So it was a message that that we, um, you know, tried to share through Funk Volume. It was kind of a just just a tagline, but um, it was something that Dizzy said first in a song a while back, and then he had a song called Still Moving. And I can tell you as someone who's been, you know, in hip hop almost as long as there was hip hop, when you see a breakup, people are going to say whatever they're right. going to say. But ultimately, when you step back and let a little bit of, of time pass, you will see right. who... Uh, you know, where the talent is based on the success of the individuals. Well, and that, you know what I'm saying? And that's true, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not jumping back into this to, to, to prove anything to anyone. And I wish Hop, I mean, I think Hop will continue to do it. Like, Hop's fans are super loyal. Um, 
you know, so they're gonna subscribe to everything that he's got going on. Um, where he grows from there is where he has, you know, to figure it out. Um, and, and I hope he figures it out. But, you know, every artist needs an infrastructure, right? Every artist needs an infrastructure. And I can't, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm gonna say, I didn't do anything that's like rocket science, but it takes a hell of a lot of work and a hell of a lot of dedication, bringing the right people in, building the right team. Um, can he find somebody to do that again? Sure. How did Warner Brothers take, uh, you know, the fact that they invested into this company that's now no more? Right. Well, they, I mean, they recouped their advance. Okay. I mean, again, it wasn't, it wasn't in, like that impressive of an advance. Right. So was it millions off, and millions? Yeah, so even off those, those few projects that were, they were released, so they okay. didn't, you know, they didn't lose money in the process. And they still wanted to work with, with me and Dizzy. Um, but I told them, you know, at least right now, we kind of need to move like super independently um, and figure things out. So the relationship is definitely still intact, and I'd, and I'd be open to, to a conversation later on down the road if, if they wanted to, to work again. But at the moment, um, you know, there's no Warner involvement, but I'm still cool with, with everybody that's there. And they understood that what I was going through. I'm sure they've seen like, it before, lots that, of times. That, not, <laughs> and they, they saw it play out, you know. They had, they had meetings with Hobson. They understood what I was what I was dealing with. So they were sympathetic to, I got phone calls the day of when that video, oh, a lot of phone calls <laughs> the day of when that, when that video came out, a lot of supportive conf phone calls. So that was, that, was, that was cool, you know, to have so many people reach out and be like, you know, Dame, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I know that's not you, you know. Um, and, and a lot of those phone calls were from Warner, so I appreciated it. Gotcha. All right, well, Dame, appreciate you coming in and Giving your side of the story? My pleasure. No My doubt. Pleasure. Thank you. But what do you think about the whole situation? Man, my point of view, man, I really feel like they tried to paint a, a bad picture on my brother and tried to make him look like, like he was a hater. Uh, it was some envy, jealousy type shit, you know what I'm saying? And actuality, you know what I'm saying? Bro, been having this shit, man. He been in the condo. I got my hat on and I had my Coke bottles up under my hat. And I'm sitting at the dinner table like an asshole with the hat on, knowing she's gonna tell me to take it off. And I'm just sitting there just gawping down, you know, in my zone. She said, take that goddamn hat off at the dinner table. I'm like, come on, mom. Coat everywhere. 